The Tom Woods Show, episode 2281. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, you are surrounded by irrational, panicked people who think you're a terrible person because you don't want to lock everybody in their houses. No amount of reasoning appears to accomplish anything. And not to mention the media has done nothing but stoke fear and fail to provide context. Well, one of the many benefits you get as a supporter of The Tom Woods Show is membership inside The Tom Woods Show Elite. Recently migrated off Facebook, so if that was holding you back, no longer. This group will keep you sane and informed, and as an added bonus, it won't accuse you of wanting to kill your grandmother. Join me in there at supportinglisteners.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. I'm delighted to welcome my friend Jeff Lescovar, whom I've known from various libertarian events for, I don't know exactly how long, but it sure seems like quite some time. And I want to talk to him. He's a businessman who, like many of you, has spent a lot of time reading in the Misesian tradition on economics and related fields. And he just had, not too long ago, an article published at lewrockwell.com that he presented as a paper at the Libertarian Scholars Conference in late summer, early fall of 2022. And it has to do really with the central question that anybody curious about politics has to ask, which is why do some people hold some views and other people hold other views? But not just that. Specifically, why is it that people seem to hold a particular cluster of views that would not appear necessarily to demand each other? So, for example, why is it that if somebody favors, let's say, a considerably higher minimum wage, why do I also almost certainly know that person's opinion on the Ukraine situation when the two issues seem to have nothing to do with each other? What is the solution to this? And people have wrestled with this a bit. And Jeff, I think, has come up with what seems to me to be a very Occam's razor type, get right to the point accounting for this phenomenon we see. So, Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. So, yeah, like you said, I've always been just fascinated by the idea or the question of why are some people on the left and some people on the right? And it seems like that question hardly even gets answered. So, like Thomas Sowell wrote a book, Conflict Divisions, where he basically says it's just different assumptions about how the world works. Lakoff wrote a book that basically says, yeah, it's different assumptions that the nurturing parent versus the strict parent. And I just found those explanations to be totally unsatisfying and nowhere near getting to the answers. And I, I think I've come up with the answers. And Tom, I will humbly say that I think it's the greatest theory of political science I've ever heard of, but I guess I'm biased on that. But, you know, like one thing, what is going on on college campuses? I'm fascinated by that. Why are people on the left protesting people from our side of the political spectrum so vigorously, they don't even want these people to be able to speak on campus. But the libertarian conservative side never does that. Those explanations that lack up and soul give no clue to what could be the answer to that question. It's so puzzling. Well, before we get into start developing your answer, I want to amplify what you just said. This was not on a college campus, but I did tell the story in my newsletter. It was, and I'm not sure if it was one or two years ago, but for three years running in January, my wife and I have gone to St. John in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And the U.S. Virgin Islands were very heavily masked. They had absurd mask requirements. But be that as it may, we were there and we were in one of these open air taxis where it's open air. I mean, there's air flowing all through the whole thing. And there are four rows of seats. And we were heading back from the beach to our place. And we didn't have a mask on it. The whole thing is stupid. Whether it was open air or not, the whole thing was stupid. But there was a young woman in the back who was with her family, young woman, probably like maybe 20 or so, and she was demanding that we wear the mask. So I very patiently, uncharacteristically patient of me, Jeff, I turned around and said, I said, I'll put this mask on. It was a fake mask, by the way, but just to satisfy people like this, I'll put this mask on as long as you understand that the only thing it will accomplish is making you feel better. It won't do anything else. And I said, because... We have to reckon with the fact that demographically similar populations that have different masking policies seem to have the same outcomes. Now, that one fact alone should make somebody curious. But you know what her response was? It wasn't to engage with me. Her response, I'm not kidding you, was to say, well, she did this several times. 
stop. Like a yep. robot. Stop. Yep. That's... I was saying something unapproved and she couldn't take it. Yeah. Why are people so silly? That's the question I want to try to answer. And I think I've got the answer. So I saw Walter Block, leading libertarian economist. He actually shook Ludwig von Mises' hand. And he's never washed it since. So I saw him at a conference and I said, Walter, how did you, or Dr. Block, how did you and Bernie Sanders, the socialist senator presidential candidate, go to the same high school, same age? I'm pretty sure they knew each other, at least as acquaintances. They ran track and field on the same team. How did you two guys with the same environment, I think they both grew up Jewish households. How did you, with the same environmental influences, how did one guy become one of the leading socialists in the country and another guy, Walter Block, be one of the leading libertarians in the country? How does this happen? And so he tapped his forehead or his temple with his index finger and he goes, I think it's genetic. And that just took me aback. And then he points to his wife who was sitting right next to him and he says, I can't even convince her. She's a socialist. And that just came out of left field. I had never thought of it like that before. So that kind of got me on to thinking like this. And really, yeah, I think the bottom line is it's genetic. And I'll explain why. If you make a few assumptions about human nature and human behavior, I think you can draw some conclusions that explain all this. So number one is you got to put hierarchy, social hierarchy in the center of your analysis. I think it's just fundamental to human action that people always consider, does what I'm doing hurt, help, or is it status neutral for my uh, position in the hierarchy or my group membership? And uh, I think hierarchy is like property rights in that property rights tell individuals who defers to whom in terms of physical objects. And hierarchy is that fundamental in that it tells individuals who should defer to whom in terms of human beings. So it's very analogous to property rights. And then the second assumption I think we can make about human action is that there are two fundamental survival strategies that humans can utilize to survive and thrive. And one is to think independently and use logic and draw conclusions and make decisions based on that. And the other heuristic, to use a fancy word, that people can use to make decisions is to just do what everyone else is doing. And if you think about it, those are just absolutely fundamental survival strategies. You can choose one or the other. And at any given time, people probably flip back and forth between the two. And I think that the human personality is pretty much genetically determined. I think twin studies have confirmed this, that most of our personality we're just born with. And nurture is not as big of a determinant of human behavior as we used to think. So I think the propensity to follow the group or to think independently is basically genetic. And I think another assumption, a third assumption that we need to make to make this all make sense is that people naturally, and we all know this is true, naturally disdain low status people and kind of are worshipful of high status people. I mean, I can't tell how many times I've heard people telling a story about their traveling or something where meeting a high status person was tremendously exciting. People love to meet celebrities and whatnot. So I, I think that if we all think about ourselves, we can really say, yeah, it's true. And I think you can look at Christianity as something that says, hey, don't treat low status people badly. We're all born with a soul and equal in the status of God. And so don't treat low status people badly. So I think that could have a big part in explaining the rise of Europe for a thousand years or more. The people at the top of the hierarchy were less likely to oppress low status people. And I think that is now going away. And I think we're getting the fruits of that from this COVID thing, which was very oppressive. So when you use those assumptions, then you can start drawing some conclusions. Well, let me say this. I think we knew some of these people in high school, didn't we? People who would have died a thousand deaths before not being in the in crowd. They would do whatever was asked of them. You want me to make fun of that kid who's a little slow over there? You got it. I'll do it because I do not want to be left out in the cold. We've all seen them. And so these are the kinds of people 
who, as they become older, are equally eager to do the bidding of the influential people outside of high school. Whoever is talking to them on the TV, they wind up having televisions for brains and they enforce the ideas these people want enforced. Yeah, that's another idea that comes out of these assumptions is the idea of ostracism of people who don't follow the group thing. I think that explains the question about college campuses. Those people that are on the left are trying to enforce tribal unity. And I think this all flows out of our tribal history. 95, not really more like 99% of human existence has been in these hunter groups where we're pack hunters like wolves and lions and teamwork is important. So you can see where it might be a genetically favorable trait to follow the group, follow the group leadership, be a team player, and to ostracize people that aren't willing to do that. I mean, it, it might have made the tribe more able to survive out in the wild. So I think that helps to explain a lot of this. Well, let me throw a little challenge at it because I had a little bit of a debate with Mark Skousen. And I'm, maybe you've heard him on the show, but he runs Freedom Fest in Las Vegas. He has a forecast and strategies newsletter. You know him? Yeah, he sponsored uh, Rothbard's History of Economic Thought, for That's example. right, and he also did that. So anyway, I've become good friends with him. And we see each other socially. We go out with the wives on a regular basis. And we just enjoy each other's company, even though I'm not fully on board the Skousen train. He's not fully on board the Woods train, but that shouldn't require saying. We just enjoy each other's company. Well, anyway, we were over at his home, his California home, and at the end of dinner, there was a big dinner party. He said, all right, we're going to retire to the living room now and have a debate. And, and he had not prepped anybody for this. And apparently the debate was with me and I hadn't been told this was going to happen. So we go in the living room and he says, the debate is on the following thing. He says, Tom seems to agree with Thomas Sowell about why it is that some people tend to have this cluster of views, why these views tend to be clustered together. The and constrained as you said, versus unconstrained vision. Right. That's what I was advocating at the time, that it's two different outlooks on the world. And those outlooks in one way or another lead to these various bundles of views. So you might not agree with that, but I think you will find somewhat naive what Mark Skousen's response to that was. He said, look, I don't like this deterministic idea that some people are just destined to hold idiotic ideas. And he didn't put it quite that way. But he said, look, in my classroom, if a student comes up to me and wants to know, well, what do you think about the minimum wage or whatever the issue is? He said, I just explain it to them and I give them both sides and I just explain it the best I can. And I get a lot of them changing their minds. He says, so I observe this with my own two eyes all the time. So he says he thought I was downplaying the ability of reason to overcome, let's say, people's less than ideal views on things. And he really felt like if he could get everybody in a room and talk to them, he could convince everybody. And I take it you're not convinced by that. And by the way, my response to that was, I said, Mark, I think it was possible to believe that up until about the mid-1990s. And in the mid-1990s, what did we get? The web browser, the widely available web browser for consumers. And what did they use it for? All the knowledge in the world is at their fingertips, and they use it for cat videos. And this, by the way, there's nothing wrong with cat videos. They're very sweet, but that's it. Now, they have all the knowledge at their fingertips they could possibly ask for, and they're not really using it. So that was their chance to discover that they'd been lied to about a lot of things, and most of them didn't take that opportunity. So I think you're being naive. How do you adjudicate this? Well, I've just been puzzled by why do people on the left seem to advocate for these policies that, in my opinion, are absolutely destructive? For example, socialism. Hasn't that been tried a million times and it never works? How can they be for this? Why are you for the tax collectors to take away all your guns? All these things, I think, are just so irrational. How can these people hold these beliefs? And I think this set of ideas explains it. I think everyone is genetically predisposed, human nature, and you want to protect your status level. And the people at the top of the hierarchy want to protect their status. So they're for anything that helps them to consolidate their control over society. The people that follow the leadership are therefore always in favor of things like gun control that helps the people at the top of the hierarchy maintain their dominance. The graduated income tax, what does that really do? It, it stops lower status people from accumulating wealth 
Instead, if their income goes up, it gets taken away. Okay, that helps high status people who already have wealth maintain their dominance over lower status people. Why, why is the corporate income tax and corporate regulations, what does that do? That prevents small companies from generating retained earnings and getting bigger and Smaller companies have a harder time dealing with regulation than bigger companies. So these are all things that tend to stop lower status corporations from achieving higher status. So I think it all follows from the idea that the high status people want to maintain their position. And the people that follow the high status people are for any policy that helps the top people maintain their position because they're team players. They want to help the team. They want to help the leadership. I mean global warming. If you look at global warming from this paradigm, it's just, okay, that gives more power to the people at the top of the hierarchy. They're going to determine how much carbon we can use. Gun controls, like lockdowns. Why were people on the left for lockdowns and people on the right? Well, it obviously gives more power to people at the top of the hierarchy. Limousine liberals, why do they exist? Why are they for socialism? Isn't socialism all about taking money away from the people at the top of the hierarchy? Well, when you look into it, it actually isn't. It's just about giving more power to the people at the top of the hierarchy. They control the whole society when there's socialism. So that's how I would respond. When he says reason can convince these people, I think, yeah, the people in the middle who have a middling urge to be with the team and a middling urge to do that, then they're convincible. But there's people at the far end of that spectrum who see being with the group In their hind brain, that is a survival strategy. So trying to argue with these people is not going to fly because they just want to hold the opinions that is the group opinion, which for them always comes from the TV set, apparently. Those those are who they think are the high-status people. And obviously, the high-status people control the media. If they didn't, why wouldn't they? Wouldn't they want to control the media so they can control the lower-status people and control how they think? So in other words, what's going on here, it's not just that high status people want to implement policies that tend to solidify their high status, but to add insult to injury, they play upon the instincts of so many low status people to be in the good graces of the high status people. So you get low status people cheering on the very sorts of things that are going to make their lives difficult. So making energy much more expensive is obviously going to make their lives more difficult, but yet you have all these what we're calling low status people really worried about quote unquote climate change because they've been told to be really worried about it. And so it's the worst possible outrage that it's bad enough that we have a group of people advocating terrible policies, but then they're exploiting the fact that so many people just want to follow their lead. Yep. But there's no, but the thing, Jeff, though, is there's no way to know exactly among the kinds of people who parrot these views, which ones can be reasoned with and which ones can't, because you do have examples like, as you know, Michael Rechtenwald, who went through his life a Marxist, and it wasn't until he was in his 50s that he somehow came to a position where he was able to repudiate all that and start over and be on our side. Yeah. But yet I would never have picked him out of a lineup 10 years ago and said, I could convince that guy. So I'm glad somebody was apparently trying. Yeah. So for the people that are at the sort of farther end of that spectrum who are extremely concerned about social status and group belonging, to try to talk them out of opinions that put them in the group and agree with the group, to them, that's like trying to talk them into doing something that will diminish their chances for survival. I think that's coming from their hind brain. So you got to sympathize with these people. This is a human instinct that's very strong in them. To leave the group means to do something like jump off a cliff. This could result in their extinguishment. I think it also explains why women are much more likely to be on the political left than men, because the political left is the mainstream media point of view. And since women in the days of our hunting days did not hunt, they were completely dependent on the group for their sustenance, for their children and themselves, especially when they're pregnant or with toddlers. So for them to go outside the group is like for them to go commit suicide. It's a survival instinct. So that's why people find trying to debate people on the left so difficult because this is a survival instinct. And another part of it, you got to remember, one of those assumptions about human nature or assertions that I 
said earlier was that it's natural to disdain lower status people and worship higher status people. So when you think about that, if there's social hierarchy, you know that there must be someone at the top. And we probably have a global hierarchy since we have international travel and communications. And if that is true, then who is at the top of the hierarchy? We don't even know. And so then it also makes sense that these people at the top of the hierarchy want to do things that will maintain their power. And I think one of the strategies they're using is divide and conquer. I mean, why is the media telling women that they should be mad at men, which is what feminism seems to be? Why do they seem to be stoking the racial divide between blacks and whites and tell blacks that whites are out to get them? And all these things seem like just part of a divide and conquer and control strategy that the elites are using to maintain their status. What do you think of that? Well, I've been actually repeating, you probably heard me a few times, your thesis, either on this podcast or when I've been a guest on other podcasts. And I refer, I give credit, I mention your name. I said, my Thank friend you, Jeff Lescovar, my pleasure, theorizes about this and has come up with this conclusion. By the way, I'm going to link to your paper on this. I'll put this stuff up at tomwoods.com slash 2281. I don't suppose we have a video of you delivering the paper, do we? No, you know, I, I videoed myself at the Libertarian Scholars Conference and yeah. my phone ran out of memory. It's the first no. time it's ever done it. I couldn't oh. believe it. Now that is Murphy's Law right there. Well, all the same, I will have a link for people who want to, at their leisure, read the whole thing. And in that paper, you know, I, I do it sort of a much more technical, Misesian approach, a praxeological approach where I'm focusing on the individual decision-making, which is how Austrian economics works. You know, you can divide the study of human action into three or four categories, simple categories. One is history, which is what we did in the past. Economics is what we do in the present. And then what I call my theory, I call that paper, the psychology of human action is why do they make the people, individuals do what they do? And I'm saying that hierarchy concerns are just fundamental. They're right up there with time preference. I mean, time preference does so much to explain human outcomes. People that are willing to wait for a bigger payoff than others, like study science in college for four years and then get a high-paying job versus someone who says, no, I'd rather have a, a good time right now. Those people that are willing to defer gratification are going to be more, more prosperous. So I think that this adds to the psychology of human action, the why of why people do what they do. I think it adds a lot. And then you can add to that ethics what we ought to do. So the paper, I look at the psychology of human action from a Misesian praxeological point of view, which means just focus on individual decision-making, which I think is a superior approach to psychology than how it's presently done, which is just like in economics, I think they're trying to ape the physical sciences where maybe that just isn't the best approach, where a Misesian praxeological approach is better. Just have a few assumptions about human nature and then build from those and then see what conclusions come out of those assumptions. And I think this is a very robust set of assumptions about human nature that just explains all kinds of things in politics. So I like it. Well, as do I, but here's what I want to ask you. Assuming this is true, then what insights do we, as people who see the world we do, like broadly libertarian, gain from this? Is it that we scale back our expectations for the likelihood that we're going to convert people, or does it help us to concentrate our efforts more precisely? What practically does this do for us? I don't know, Tom. Sometimes I think, well, it's just genetic. It's hopeless. You're never going to convince these people to do anything but follow the group. And I, the only strategy maybe that would work was like in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, who was it? Bombavirk, who was a tutor to the crown prince. And if you get the people the type of the hierarchy thinking this way, then the crowd will follow. But the thing is, the people at the top of the hierarchy, they want to maintain their status. And that includes increasing government power because they control the government, right? Whether it's if they're politicians or maybe there's a level of hierarchy above that, which I think this COVID response makes me think, yeah, there's another level of hierarchy above national leaders. So it, it makes me kind of pessimistic, but I, I'm not a pessimistic person. So maybe there's enough people in the middle that 
we just need to focus our energy on and just realize that the people that are really concerned about group belonging are just never going to be convinced because it goes against their survival instincts. So I don't know, well, Tom. I will say what I have done a few times just being playful on Twitter is when I've encountered somebody like this who's got all the icons in the profile indicating an obsession with everything that the elites are obsessed with, so I know this is one of these types of people, I try to see if I can reach them a little bit by saying, ah, I knew guys like you in high school, always had to be in the in crowd, always had to repeat everything that was believed by the people at the top. I know that there's a tremendous instinct to want to support the most powerful voices in society because I met these kids in high school. So I'm completely familiar with where you're coming from. That's not what that person thinks he's doing. The person who repeats the stuff about whatever it is, Ukraine or climate change or whatever, the COVID, all that, that person thinks he's striking a blow for the little guy for some reason. And so to be suddenly told, oh yeah, I know you sort of people who just want to defend the elites all the time. I just kind of hope it stirs one of them every once in a while. Yeah, and I think if you can get people to understand that the people at the top of the hierarchy probably hate us ordinary people. They don't have our best interest in mind. They want to maintain their power. So just understanding that people at the top probably hate us and giving more power and money to people who hate you is not going to help you. I don't know if you get through to people on that level, but it's sort of an emotional level that maybe they can understand. I don't know. Uh, I like to leave people on an up note. You know, I can't always do it. I cannot always do it. There are some subjects, you know, if we're talking about Mao's China, eh, there's not a lot of an up note there. But yeah, maybe, in, you know, because you and I talk a lot, so maybe we can theorize about ways we can, assuming this insight is true, and let me just say, it has tremendous explanatory power. That's the thing. I think it has tremendous explanatory power. What can we do with it? I mean, well, I, I'll say that, well, let me just finish this one quick thing. Because in my case, COVID really exposed this to me, that there are people who will actively act against their own interests without even bothering to look to see. They're being team players. Yeah. yeah, they didn't even bother to look to see, well, maybe there's a chance that COVID isn't as bad as they've told me or that there's another way of looking at this or when they could see that their livelihoods were threatened, their lifestyles were threatened, you'd think they'd look around just to, out of curiosity. Are there any dissident voices about this? And then I saw that there just weren't any, or that there are very, or let's just say, there were far fewer such people than I thought there would be. That has led to a shift in my own personal emphasis that, yeah, I still produce the Tom Woods show and that goes out all over the world. And I still catch people and bring them in with the old Tom Woods show. And that makes me very proud. But now like with my school of life program and stuff, I'm more focused on taking the people who are already with me, who already are anti-elite, and try to build them up even more, help them build whatever it is, businesses or really, really important projects, or just learn how to invest money in real estate, or whatever, practical things that can make their lives better. I think my time is better spent there than hopelessly trying to convince somebody with every fashionable emoji in their Twitter profile. That's just the way I've concluded. You know, I see on Twitter all the time people making comments like, why do these people, that be the people on the left, why do they think like this? What is going on here? And I think I'm offering an excellent explanation here of why they are the way they are. And if maybe a lot of people start understanding that the political divide is really about people who support more power for the people at the top of the hierarchy and helping them maintain their status versus people who want to think for themselves and live their own life and de-emphasize hierarchy like the Christian faith encourages people to do. Maybe that can get through to a, enough people, those people in the middle, that we can turn the tide. Well, let's hope. Let's see what happens in the comments. I'm going to be curious to see what people think about what you've said. But as I say, I'm going to link to what you wrote so people can look at it at their leisure. That's at tomwoods.com 2281. One criticism people might have it's not really a criticism because it doesn't change the analysis any, but they might think that in a way there's a kind of elitism to this analysis that, well, some people are just going to be enthralled to the elites and not really understand what their own interests are. I mean, that's kind of the way Marxists look at the proletariat that, or at least let's say Marxist Leninists would say, unless we get out there and really agitate among them, they're not going to be able to assess their own interests. They're going to get diverted into 
useless things like labor unionism and stuff like that unless we get out there and convince them. Is there any kind of answer to the idea that this is an elitist way of looking at people? Well, I don't think it's elitist because you'll notice that people on the left have probably the same IQ distribution as people on the right. They're every bit as as intelligent as we are, but they're being team players and cooperating with the top of the hierarchy. So I don't think that's necessarily elitist at all. It's just stating that there is a propensity to want to follow the group and be a team player and that this varies just like IQ or height among individuals. And it's probably somewhat genetic, but I think we're rational animals and we can overcome our genetic programming with the right stimuli, I guess. Well, again, I'll link people to your paper, tomwoods.com slash 2281, and we'll see if we can get a good discussion going about it. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate this. Do you have a final word? I did a few really short YouTube videos. There's, I think, three or four of them. They're three or four minutes long, if people are interested in that. Just Jeff Lescovar. So maybe I'll get some views on that, too. How about I post them? I'll post them at tomwoods.com slash 2281. We'll see. Sounds good, Tom. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been fun. Thank you so much, Jeff. All right. Bye. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.